Thank you, Stephanie. Let's pray. Father, open up our hearts and minds, Lord. You want to speak to us. You want to engage us. And not simply our emotions, but our intellect, our minds, to challenge us with your truth. So, Father, fill this building with your Holy Spirit power and transform us by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Easter was awesome. Praise God for everyone who could be here. And, um, you know, I, I think the Holy Spirit did a, a mighty work. A lot of people, I saw a lot of people I've never seen before who, when they left, had tears in their eyes. And if you find yourself tearing up in worship, that's a sign that God is He's doing something in you. You may not even know what it is, but he's setting you free in some way. And lots of times we begin to tear up. God is so good. Now, of course, the Sunday after Easter is even known as quote unquote low Sunday. Okay, alright. But I want you to keep praying for those who were here on Easter. For those who went to worship on Easter Sunday around the world, that God will begin igniting their hearts, their minds, and their souls to want that relationship with Him and to come back to worship. Amen. Because it's the Lord that works in our hearts to help us understand how essential this is, how this is everything, a relationship with God. So don't forget to keep praying for everyone who has yet to really lean into that relationship with Jesus. All right, so today, opening minds. Luke 24, then Jesus said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. See, so Jesus is saying to his disciples, everything in the Bible, everything in the Old Testament, came true in him. It was all pointing toward Jesus. And, you know, I love worship, and I love great worship music, and praise God, how can we thank God for our worship music? Isn't God great? We love that. And it's wonderful to have your emotions stirred, but I gotta tell you, emotions don't last. Amen? We are not here to entertain any I don't know about you, but I've rarely gone to a movie that truly changed my life. But that's what Jesus is all about. So he may touch our emotions, but he wants to go so much further beyond that. He wants to engage our minds. Because once our minds start opening up to him and considering his words, what Jesus says, not what other people say about Jesus, but his words specifically, that's when lives begin to transform. That's when people come to know the truth and are set free. See, an emotional response may touch our hearts and get our attention. But when Jesus, when Jesus begins to open our minds, that's when our lives start to change. Truly transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, first, Jesus opens our minds with his words, then the Holy Spirit blows our minds. With wisdom and application. I mean, it's truly astonishing how the Holy Spirit works. If we will simplify, I mean, why was it that ordinary people just would fall over each other getting to Jesus just to sit and listen to him? And the Bible tells us again and again that they were amazed by his teachings. They were just amazed because he spoke as one who had authority. He wasn't referencing anybody else. He was speaking from his own heart and soul, and it was truth. And people were like, oh my goodness. I've never heard anything like this before. It's like, well, yeah, this is Jesus. He came from heaven. He's telling us what the Heavenly Father wants us to know. He's telling us exactly what God wants to know. And the Holy Spirit just starts transforming minds. I mean, if you've been here for a while, I used to... Uh, use scripture somewhat, but mostly I would just tell you what I thought. 
nothing wrong with that necessarily, but God has kind of convicted my heart that mostly you just need to hear Jesus. And I'll fill in a little of my thoughts, but mostly it's the Word of God, specifically the Word of Jesus. And when we start hearing Him and wrestling with His words, watch out. I mean, the Holy Spirit. I, I've had I've had couples who have come in to me. They're going through some marital problems, and and uh, I don't even ask them um, what the problem is. The Holy Spirit just leads me. So like, let's jump in the Bible. Let's listen to some of Jesus' words. Sometimes forty five minutes we'll look at two different teachings of Jesus, and I have never had anyone ask my advice after that. They're like, okay, I got it. I know what we're supposed to do. Because Jesus spoke to them, and the Holy Spirit began applying the teachings of Jesus, and they. They both do what they need to do. And it's gracious, and it's loving, and it's forgiving, and it's life transforming. And that's what we're about. Praise be to God. The Holy Spirit blows our minds with wisdom and application. Jesus says this, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, notice his word, Jesus' words, you are truly my disciples, you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. Free from what? I don't know. What do you mean set free from? In your life, worry, fear, regret, anger, self-righteousness, judging other people. What do you need to be set free from? Jesus will do it. His words. If we abide in His words. You know, and I heard them. I heard the, uh, this rabbi one time, he was talking, he said, you know, Jesus never really said anything new. It was just the way he put it all together from the Old Testament. That was new. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And then I started reading my Bible. Oh my goodness, that's so not true. It's not. Jesus said this. You have heard this been said, right? Do not commit adultery. I say to you, if you look at a woman with in your partner, you're guilty. You're guilty. Jesus said, when Peter asked the Lord, how many times should I forgive my neighbor? The teaching at the time was three. Forgive him three times. Peter said, as many as seven times. Jesus said, not seven. Seventy times. Seven times. No one on earth had ever said that before. Ever. That's crazy. You forget seventy times seven times? That's insane, right? The world says, fool me once, Shame on you. Fool me twice, but shame on me. What does that mean? That means if you hurt me and I trust you again, I forgive you one time, and you hurt me again, shame on me. I never should forgive you in the first place. The world says, never forgive. Jesus says, forgive, 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 forgive. As you have been forgiven, you just keep passing that on. Don't judge people. Don't bottle up the love of God. Let him love you, set you free, forgive you, and then you just forgive everyone every day. You tell me, what's the key to a new life in Jesus Christ? Learning to forgive everyone, everything, every time, or never forgiving anyone? Because that's what the world says. And the world will say ridiculous things like, okay, I forgive you, but I'm not going to forget it. What does that mean? I mean, engage your mind. What does, he, what does that actually mean? What it means is, okay, so some, some such a good person, I'll still be in a relationship with you, but I'm never, ever, ever going to forget what you did to me. So if you ever make me mad again, I'm going to take that out of my back pocket and bludgeon you with it. I'll forgive you, but I'm never going to forget. No. Jesus wants to set us free from that stuff. As we have been forgiven, we pass it on to forgive. We don't produce that forgiveness. We receive it, and we pass it on. And that's the key. One of the keys to a life that is set free from bitterness and anger and judging other people. I'm just going to assume you want to be set free today. If you like being angry and judgmental and worried, okay, but there's a whole new life. He wants to engage your mind, not just your emotions. Emotions may get our attention, but they will not transform our lives. The Word of God is what transforms us. Okay? That's why we're starting a new series, Red Letter Living Series. Red Letter, there are a lot of Bibles that have uh, just the words of Jesus in red letters. I like those Bibles. Okay? Because, you know, we can get off track even reading the Bible. Did you know that? Did you know that KKK used to be Bible studies before they went out with the traffic in America?
stuff in the Old Testament is pretty brutal. If you study that, yeah, maybe. There is nothing Jesus has ever taught that would allow us to be to do violence against anybody. That is not Jesus. That is not him. Red letter little series. So we're just gonna focus like a laser on Jesus and his words. And I'm telling you, lives are gonna be completely transformed through the word of God, through Jesus' words, just like they were two thousand years ago, just like they have been ever since then for people who will just focus on him and what he says. Not what the world tells you, not what I tell you, he says. We're gonna be in the word. Amen? Alright. John 8, 33. Jesus says, right? Truth sets free. They answered him, we're offspring, offspring of Abraham. We've never been a slave to anyone. How is it you say you will become free? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is what? A slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. How many sinners are in here today? That means we're all slaves to sin. Slaves. We can't do anything about it. But Jesus has. When he went to the cross, and when he said it is finished, he paid the price for all of our sins. All of them. Don't hold on to guilt. He already paid the price for that guilt. Give it to him. He died for you because he loves you. Let him set you free from guilt and shame and worry and regret. You know, I mean, who doesn't have things that we, if we, if we, we go back, you know, we choose to go back in our lives and change? I mean, everybody has regrets, and yet when you think about it, maybe some of the biggest mistakes were brought you to Jesus. It's what humbled you enough to realize, I cannot do this on my own, and I'm tired of hurting the people in my life, and I'm going to give God a try. Good. So then do we regret it? Not really. We regret that we don't hurt people, but... If that's what it takes to come to Jesus and make things right, okay. Okay. And Jesus says this, I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because what? My word finds no place in you. He's saying he would just let my words be into you. You wouldn't want to hurt anyone.
guy, he was a very intelligent man. I mean, there are some things I read from Paul in the New Testament that I don't get. But I love Peter, you know, because Peter's like, yeah, there's some things I read about Paul, I don't understand what he's saying to you. It's okay. It's a highly intellectual individual. This is what he wrote. And when I, and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided that you know nothing among you except what? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's all we've got. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Not fake arguments, not really in depth secret things. Jesus and the cross of Christ. That's all we've got. Praise God. That's all we need. Christ Jesus and Him crucified. You know, Jesus said very clearly in Matthew 7, Do not judge, you will not be judged. The same way you judge, you will be judged. Right? So he's like, look, just don't judge people. We're all tempted to judge people. I mean, if somebody in front of me throws a cigarette out their car, they're a horrible person, right? I mean, I just immediately judge them. Everybody does, I think. The question is how long you stay in that spirit. How long before you know what, Lord, please forgive me. Maybe it slipped. Please forgive me for judging somebody. Don't to judge. How long do you stay in that judgmental spirit? We all judge. It's just part of being human, I guess. But don't stay there. Confess it, right? Jesus says, do not judge me when I judge. But there is one area that he said, you need to be very careful about this group of people. You know who that is? False prophets. False prophets. Religious leaders like me. He said, you need to be very careful who you are listening to. How can you tell if someone's a false prophet? Very simply. Are they giving you Jesus and Him crucified or not? That's it. Are they giving you Jesus and Him crucified the cross of Christ or not? Are they teaching you how to live your best life now? If you didn't know this, let me tell you, I don't care how good your life is here, it's not your best life. Your best life is going to be in heaven. People who have gone before us in heaven are more alive than all the rest of us combined. It is not about having your best life here. Life is about listening to Jesus, submitting to Him, and letting Him turn us into the people who were always created to be. And it's not easy. But if you are committed to that, to listening to Him, He'll bring a miracle. He'll bring a miracle. Praise God. So beware of false prophets. And, and one of the things that I need you to know is beware of people who are great speakers. If they're not giving you Jesus and the cross of Christ, you just you pray for them, but, right? Jim Jones. Everybody know Jim Jones? Guyana? Over 900 people committed ritual suicide there. I watched this thing on him this last week. Oh my goodness. He was a very charismatic man. Very charismatic. He was a Christian preacher. And then one day, in the middle of the worship service, he closed his Bible and he threw it to the back of the room. And he said, you no longer listen to that, from now on you listen to me. At that point, you get up and you leave. How do we know if people are false prophets? Very simply, Jesus and Him crucified. That's it. And if the preacher is giving you Jesus and Him crucified, praise God. Don't leave because you get mad. Is he telling you what Jesus said? Right? If he's telling you what Jesus said, praise God. Dig in. See what God's trying to show you. But don't leave. On the other hand, we're not giving you Jesus and the crucified. You pray for us, but you need to find a church that does. Okay? Alright. So the Apostle Paul wrote this, Romans 5, 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have been justified by faith. See, all of us, God has written His law on our hearts. So it doesn't matter if everybody tells me what I'm doing is okay and right. If, if it's wrong, the, the law of God is convicting me and I'm not going to have any peace. People will say, you know what, the Old Testament God is so different from the New Testament God. The Old Testament God had a lot of wrath. Well, the New Testament God, justice, wrath, and we all have this sense of justice in us. I mean, if somebody kills someone, we all have this sense that they have to pay for it, right? I mean, that's not, that's not evil. Justice is not evil. 
But the difference is this. In the New Testament, God took all of his wrath out on Jesus. On Jesus. We accept his gift, his death on the cross. We are covered by his blood. We are forgiven and we have peace with God. <laughs> well, you're quite a sinner. You don't know anything. You know, I'm worse than you know. But God loves me just the way I am. Jesus Christ died for me so I can live with him forever. He has forgiven me. He has set me free. I forget it all the time. But it's all about love and grace. We have been justified with, with thy faith. Therefore, we have peace with God. And Jesus said, He opened their minds, their minds to understand the scriptures. Jesus says this, and behold, I am sending the promise, Holy Spirit, of my Father upon you to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. I want to give you an example of how the Word of God and the Holy Spirit works. We were looking at this yesterday morning with our men's group. How many of our men here were here yesterday morning? Okay. Those guys, okay? And um, so we're looking at this, and Jesus said to the disciples, okay, you guys have been with me three years, but you still don't have the Holy Spirit, so you're not ready to be my witnesses. You stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. And then once the Spirit gets into you, the Spirit of wisdom and power and, and, and strength and faith, then you're ready to go and proclaim the gospel throughout the world. And so we're talking about it, what do you see, what do you see? And it's not right or wrong, it's just, you know, you just talk. I think his first disciples were probably just sitting around a campfire after one of these, you know, teachings and just talking about it. What do you think he meant? They helped each other. Right? So, um, we're doing that. About 15 minutes into the discussion, Michael, Michael, go right away. So, Michael, oh, he's, um, he, uh, he's got a cage fight coming up here in a couple months, and he would like to invite his entire church family to come. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay? Look. Wow. So, now, nothing in me is interested in doing that ever. I would never, okay, ever, right? It's just way too brutal. You never know what God has for you. You never know. When we give up control and just follow the Holy Spirit, He brings us to the most fascinating people, or He brings them to us. Michael came into the church back in like June, I guess, and, and, and it was part of the financial peace program, and, and he just felt compelled to say, hey, I, I think I'm supposed to meet with your pastor. So he found Nicole, right? And Nicole came and found me, and, and so I thought it was going to be like a five-minute conversation. It was an hour and a half, and pretty much all we did was open the Word of God. That's it. And Jesus spoke to Michael, okay? And he started going to Bible studies a week. Once your mind starts opening to the Holy Spirit, man, you just get ravenous for what God has. It's the coolest thing to watch. Okay? So anyway, yes, they were talking about it. Michael's like, okay, so, okay, so, like, me, the what's saying to me is, so, like, what happens in our home is huge. That's where you learn the basics. Like, he's saying, don't leave Jerusalem. Don't leave it. You're not ready. You're not, he said, to me, that, that's like in our homes. You know, that as parents, we have to tell our kids over and over and over again, right? Say thank you, say please. I mean, that's where they learn the basics of life. And so I think that's partly what God is saying to us, is that man, we will let him really get into our hearts and minds in our homes. Then, then we're good to go. Because that's where the real battle is. In our homes. And, and so it goes from one thing to the next to the next, and, and, and other guys say things. It's interesting how the Holy Spirit works. It's just the coolest thing to be part of those discussions. And then Rob Boy, Rob, you gotta wait. This is one of my favorite things I've heard in a long time. Rob Boy says this. He said, Let me tell you some wisdom from my grandmother. You ready for grandma's wisdom? Because grandma's they got some wisdom. <laughs> this is what he said. You're a home devil and a street angel. <laughs> Think about that. You're a home devil. And a street angel. I love that. I love that. I, it immediately reminded me of this comic strip that I saw of a pastor. Well, I don't, you know, his pastor. He's, this man sitting there at the breakfast table in the morning. He stares at his phone. He's rumble, 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 rumble. And then when he steps out the door with his butter collar on, he puts on a smile. <laughs> a home devil. But a street angel. Because we got to put on our best in front of each other, right? Of course, that wears you out. At least it wears me out. It wears me out to walk around with a smile on my face when I'm dying inside. 
and I'm miserable. And, and that, I came to the point where I just couldn't keep going as a pastor. I was like, Lord, you either have got to show me how to come back to you and get my, my spirit on fire for you again, and you've got to get me out, because I cannot keep doing this double-minded thing. I can't keep standing up on Sunday mornings talking to people about this life, transform, life transformation that is a distant memory. It used to be part of my life, but it's not now. So you either got to get me back or get me out, because I can't do this. I cannot do this anymore. The Lord spoke to my heart. He said, no. Are you going to give me back my church? It's yours. From now on, Lord Jesus, it is about you and your cross. And that's it. That's it. Christ and him crucified. Because it's exhausting to be that double-minded. It takes so much energy to appear like we're just... Right? People know you're a Christian, know you're a happy Christian. It's like, I don't know what that means, but you know. Now I've got my life together. Everything's good. I'm a Christian. And then we get home and we're so worn out from living that deception that we just take it out on the people in our lives. But we're so tired. But what if we let God transform us in our homes? What if we allow the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, to peace with God. So we're at peace at home. And then when we step out, we're at peace with ourselves as we walk through this world too. And we're not here to entertain anyone. We're just following Jesus. We love him. And we're here for others. Okay? So, here's the question. How does the Holy Spirit transform us from home devils, sweet street angels, into peaceful, loving, and faithful followers of Jesus? Whether we're at home, because to me, that's the miraculous life, the transformation that God is doing all of us. So how, how can we get there? How can we do that with God's help? Well, I want to suggest to you today there are two simple ways. The Holy Spirit opens our minds and transforms our homes. Insight, in mind, and scripture study. Right? The old saying, out of sight, out of mind. We'll flip that around. Insight, in mind, and scripture study. Insight, in mind. Make your house, your apartment, a sanctuary to Jesus Christ. That no matter how crazy the world is out there, when you get home, you're going to see reminders of God's presence, His love for you, His Word. One of the members here gave us this cross. Hang on our own. This is the painting of Jesus and the way, the truth, and the life. This, love is patient, kind, Always trust, always hope, so there it goes. Our daughter, and for us on our anniversary. There's a lot in this that touches our hearts when we see it. We have it in our office. This is what our daughter made. Each of the kids in their rooms, in sight, in mind, God loves waiting. And his mom made this for him. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hanging on his wall. When he moves, this is Michael. Inside your mind. Be strong and courageous, right? The Lord your God is with you. Okay? He's got a bed on God bless Micah up there. When he was born, there was someone here to do woodwork and we made two of those ones where he went to Micah and go with him. Wherever they go. God bless Micah. And well, the Lord is my strength and my song. Her mom made these for them. The duck season, that was from, that was from the drunk court. The way Michael ran that, you know, the bugs, what do you think, the duck, the duck season, the rabbit season? She's got a lot of interesting things on her wall, but this is one of them. Spiritual food inside the mind, um, these things we provide for you. This came to me this week. I, I put it right up on the fridge. If any of you have teenagers, they might occasionally open the fridge. Put this right there for them, for yourself, to see and read. This has just one or two verses and then some questions. Um, one of those from this past week that I really like, Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's a great scripture. That's an incredible, thought-provoking word of God. And some of the questions. 
In order to walk in the new life God has for us, we need to bury the old life. What are some aspects of your old life you can bury? I sat down with our three kids yesterday. We talked about that. It was just a great Holy Spirit time. It's not complicated. Okay? And then the next question, I love this. What are some aspects of your old life that keep climbing out of the grave? And with God's help, are reburied again and again and again. Right? Like the song used, climbing out of the grave. The fear, the worry, whatever it is. It's a great discussion to have with your kids. Right? Scripture study. Open the Word to be able to sit next to them. We give this to you for a reason. So you can use it. Okay? So the Word of God can give us your home. Preaching is one way you can do it. Open the Bible, get them all sitting down. Repent, sinners! I wouldn't recommend it. That doesn't work too well. See the dog there? We even tried to have her be afraid of the picture. She's always afraid of me. I don't know why. You know, I'll put the dog in the hospital. We can do it that way. Or, how about this? Just scripture discussion. What do you see? What's God saying to you? And you know what? This came to me this morning, right before worship began. This might be the best way of transforming a home that incorporates everything. Insight, mind, and scripture discussion. Right? Jesus is a good shepherd. Color with your kids. And as you're coloring, as you're doing that, talk to them about the story, about Jesus, right? That, that, he tells the story of a you know, hundred sheep and one wanders away and he'll leave the ninety-nine just to go find the one. And what does that tell you about Jesus? What does that tell you about his heart for you and how much he loves you? That even when you wander away, and we all wander away from time to time, he is not going to let that go. He's going to come after So moms and dads, and, and you know, you just Google it. Christian, you know, coloring book or coloring sheets. Print it out. Read the story. Color with your children. Decorate your entire house with these stories of Jesus. Okay? And I also don't think we ever get too old to not color. Two simple ways that Holy Spirit opens our minds and transforms our homes. In sight, in mind, make your house a sanctuary to Jesus Christ and His love. And get into the Word. He will transform your mind. And then when you walk out, you're just you, following Jesus, loving everybody. And you'll be getting closer and closer and closer <laughs> to the greatest challenge. I don't think we ever quite arrived at this. Dear Lord, help me become the person my dog thinks me. <laughs> You'll never quite get there. That is you. Make your house a sanctuary of Jesus Christ. You get into his word. Jesus is the first of all. And the Holy Spirit transforms you. You're going to get pretty close. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have given us our intellect. Thank you that you do not want us to set it aside to grow in faith. That you actually want to challenge us intellectually in our minds. Because Lord, if what Jesus says is true, if he is the way, the truth, and the life, then we can come with every question in the world and you're not afraid of it. Because the truth will stand no matter what. So Lord, help us this week to, to begin to allow your spirit to transform our homes by your love. Help us to get into your word more this week than we've ever done before, to listen to you. Help our children listen to you like never before. We don't need to worry about what to say. You'll take the conversation. But give us that conviction to open your word at least once this week.